So on behalf of York St John University, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture of Professor Adam Leyland. Professor Leyland is a, is a truly inspirational leader in the field of healthcare. He first joined the NHS in 2005 as a community first responder. He also worked as a call taker for Staffordshire Ambulance Service and then qualified as a paramedic. He has worked for several ambulance trusts, eventually becoming a consultant paramedic. He remains today registered for the NHS as an emergency care bank practitioner, and you'll be amazed to know he was working last Sunday. <laughs> Adam is now National Head of Commissioning at Health Education England and is a recognised senior leader. He is also a trustee of Community Transport, an organisation that helps people to stay independent, participate in their communities and access vital public services and employment through provision of transport. <coughs> he is Chair of the UK Committee for Healthcare Organisation Management at the British Standards Institution, also a former Chair and now a Board Member of the Leadership and Management Working Group of the International Network for Healthcare Workforce Education. Adam has a wealth of other roles throughout his career, um, but I won't read them all out. In 2020, we were absolutely delighted that Adam accepted the title of Visiting Professor in Leadership and Management at York St John University. This professorial title recognises Adam's valuable contributions as a leader but also the very human impact that he has on the communities around him. Adam reflects the core values of York St John in his commitment to supporting our society, its health and its healthcare workforce. We are honoured to have Adam with us and to have the opportunity to share in his knowledge and experience. I would now like to invite Professor Leyland to give his inaugural professorial lecture entitled Leading for a Continuous Supply of Workforce in the NHS in England. I'd like to invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Leyland. Thank you very much, Carol. Lovely introduction. That's very, very kind of you. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, those that are here in the audience and those that are watching us back. You'll forgive me for standing behind the lectern because I've got some notes that I want to read out rather than just the slides, if that's okay. But it is an absolute pleasure to be up here in, in York and at York St John University. Uh, as Karen said, it was 2020 when I was uh, very kindly offered the position to be a visiting professor and of course we've had a troublesome couple of years where it's meant I've not been able to get up here so it's been lovely uh, to be here this evening. And a huge thank you to the events team that have enabled this uh, as well this evening. They've, they've done a tremendous job of keeping me informed and, and making sure I'm coming uh, as well. So thank you very much. As Karen said, um, I am the National Head of Commissioning for Health Education England. Um, but more importantly tonight, I'm a visiting professor for York St John University. So I do want to start off with a caveat. And the caveat is, whilst I've got the role in the NHS, Tonight, I am not speaking on behalf of the NHS, I'm not speaking on behalf of the university, of course. Um, and I do want some audience participation to start off with, so please don't get too comfortable just to start off with. Uh, and for those of you um, that have been in academia, keep your academic hat on tonight. I want you to think about what we can study, how we can support the NHS from the academic Is that any better? There we go, right, that's, that's me into Madonna mode now though, I'm afraid. Um, so please keep your academic hat on. Think about what we can study, what, how academia can better support the NHS, how research can play a huge and important part in what the NHS is doing to make uh, the population better overall. Uh, and of course, research isn't always about clinical stuff as well. There's a lot of things we can do outside of the clinical. So, to start off with, 
Can you stand up in the room if you've ever worked for the NHS? Quite a few people, excellent. Have a look around, you probably know each other anyway, but did you know each other in the NHS? No. No? Nobody did? Okay, grab a seat. Um, stand up if you've ever been treated by the NHS. <laughs> Well, put your hand up. That's absolutely fine. You can put your hand up as well. Thank you very much. Have a look around. I think everybody stood up there. Stand up if you've got a relative, a close relative, that works in the NHS. A couple of people. Great, thank you. And stand up if you know anybody who works in the NHS at the moment. Have a look around again. Thank you. So... We can see the NHS touches everybody's life in one way, shape or form. It could be through somebody that you know, it could be through the treatments that we receive. Some of us might not need the NHS for a really long time, you're very lucky if you don't. But at some point it's there when you do need it. And that's the fundamental purpose of making sure we have got a continuous supply of workforce for the NHS. So when you need it, when your family needs it, Later on in life, tomorrow, hopefully not, next week, years to come, you've got the right healthcare professionals there to treat you and to make you better so that you live longer and live a, live a better life. So the old saying back in 1948 was from cradle to grave. And that's so true of the NHS now, 74, nearly 75 years later. So we want to know when we're there that it's going to work for us. We want to know that when we need it, it's going to do what it, it has to do. Because otherwise we don't really think about it, do we? Apart from coming to this tonight, did anybody really think about the NHS earlier on? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. Unless anybody's involved in it at the moment, you might have thought about it. But generally we go around our lives, we don't really think about the NHS. Until somebody tries to mess with it. When somebody tries to mess with it, governments and what have you, that's when we start to get quite passionate about it. And rightly so, it's there for us when we need it. But all we ever hear is there's too much management. Waiting times, I can't see my GP. The criticism, the putting it down constantly. What do you think that does to those that work in the NHS? Those of you that know people or have worked in the NHS, it's really demoralising when you see that across the news, you see politicians standing up criticising. We are still one of the best health services in the world. We're still achieving better outcomes than a lot of places in the world. Yes, there's more we can do. Yes, there's things we can do better. But that's what being a continuing, improving organisation is about. 74 years of history means we can do things better. People are living longer. And we'll go into some of that as well. So, just a few interesting facts. Since I've been speaking already, about 3,000 people have been treated in the NHS. By the time I finish, about 30,000 people would have been treated in the NHS. Some for the very first time, some for their ongoing care needs, some probably saying their last goodbyes to their family, and some saying their first hellos to their newborns. We really are from cradle to grave. So it's reasonable, therefore, as a taxpayer and as a citizen to expect that we have the, the best people treating us, isn't it? Anybody disagree with that? Hello? Is this working? <laughs> Just checking. Cool. So um, it's reasonable as a taxpayer to know that when we get the best people, we're going to train them to be the best, aren't we? And it's reasonable as a taxpayer to know that your public money is being spent wisely to make sure we have an NHS of the future. And that's where my day-to-day -day job comes in. Across England, we have the largest education and training budget in the world. Anybody got any ideas what that budget might be? Shout out if you want. We'll do a higher or lower. I'll go into Bruce Long's life. <laughs> Any, any clues? Two billion. Two billion. Higher or lower? 60 billion. Yeah, I, I wish. I wish. 
lower than two billion, no, it's actually higher, it's 5.3 billion pounds a year we spend on training the future healthcare workforce of this, of England alone. So not a bad guess, what? Two billion pound of it spent roughly on, on medics. Um, so that's 14.5 million pounds a day. Could you imagine spending that? Wouldn't you love to spend that? That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, or, since I've started talking, £100,000 has been spent. It's that massive what we're trying to do to support everybody. So, with all of that money going in, we shouldn't have an issue really, should we? You know, I'm, I'm of the belief that there's enough money in the NHS overall, we just need to spend it a little bit better. But, if only it was that simple. But it can be simple. But we just have too many complexities that are stopping us from making it simple. So I want to introduce you to a, a word, a favourite word of mine for the last 12 months, which is simplexity. And the simplexity is an emerging theory on the convergence of the relationship between things that are complex and things that are simple. So if we can create an education pipeline in our future workforce that's got all the right levels available to it, and all the right levers to make those levels possible, we shouldn't have an issue in the future. So we can break some of that complexity and make it much, much more simple. So we get better quality, we get a better impact, and we can get better value for money to the taxpayer overall. But there's a few problems in the way for us. Um, what's coming over the hill? Anybody remember that song? What's that coming <coughs> over the hill? It is a monster. It really is a monster. The projections back in 2015 for the world population was going up to 7.9 billion people on this planet by 2025, up to 9.3 billion by 2050. This year, we are going to hit 8 billion people on this planet next month. It's, it's gone well ahead of the projections. That is a major issue for healthcare around the world. And throughout that, we've been facing, before COVID, major problems, what I used to call the triple threat. Aging and increasing populations, which impacts on our demand and our supply overall. The reducing finances that we've got around the world, which is creating an inequality. And workforce shortages, which is creating an efficiency problem. And then we have the pandemic and the lasting impact of the pandemic and the, the latest figures today aren't looking great for COVID uh, rising again and impacting where we're at with the 6.5 million people on the waiting list at the moment to receive some care. This is, this is a slightly older slide, but what I want you to notice from this is the darker colours on this represent more money going into that country's healthcare system. So you can see America is, is the darkest there, Europe and Canada roughly the same, Britain a little bit behind on it on a gross domestic product from a little while ago. This increased because of COVID. We went up to about 13% gross domestic product on health. Um, but usually we're, we're between seven and 10% uh, if you take COVID out of the equation. But compare this now to this slide about efficiency. So again, the dark colors means you're more efficient. So I'll flip back quickly. You can see the dark colors there, more money, dark colors more efficient. You start to see a flip. So particularly America there is, is one that jumps out, isn't it? It's less efficient despite all of the money going into it. And yet on a efficiency scale, we are the same as we are the same. What's going on there? Hello, there we go back. Um, we are exactly the same on Europe, yet we were having a less gross domestic product um, percentage into uh, into into the NHS overall. And of course, the World Health Organization has been telling us for a long time, we've got a global shortage. 18 million shortfall of healthcare workers by 2030. India needed 3.9 million more doctors and nurses to deal with its growing demand. China needed 180,000 obstetricians by this year. Japan needs to triple its nurses to deal with the aging population. And the UK, I'll, I'll go through some of our percentages in a bit of where we're at, needed at this time, this was done, 9.2% of all NHS posts uh, were vacant overall. And in this country alone, 
we have got an aging population. And that's a great thing. That's medicine doing what it needs to do. People are living longer and hopefully they're living healthier, longer lives at the same time. And that's the thing to celebrate. That is, that's a good thing. But over the next 15 years, the population in England alone is going to increase by another 4.2%. The number of people over the age of 85 is estimated to grow by 55%. Two thirds of adults aged over 65 are expected to be living with multiple health conditions by 2035. And 17% of people will be living with four or more diseases, which is double the number in 2015. And one third of them will have a mental illness like dementia or depression as well. All of that's increasing the contact and the need for our healthcare services to be supporting people in a very different way. Four or more diseases, it's unheard of in some, some respects. Those who used to work in the NHS, those that currently do, you know, years and years and years ago, people have one disease and unfortunately they die. They die of that disease. They never have two diseases, very rarely. Time went on, people got more and more diseases, of course, and we can treat them, we can help people, we can do things in a different way. But four or more diseases, can you imagine? Is anyone a clinician in the room? Can you hand up a clinician? No, no clinicians. I know Karen used to be a speech and language therapist. So. Um, but as a clinician, the impact of one disease on another, you could do something for one disease, and it, how's that going to impact on this other disease? And when you've got four to think of, that is a, that is a big challenge. That's really complex uh, overall. So um, where is the population rising and falling? So you can see dark colours again is where we're getting a bigger increase in the population rising. Uh, very central in the Midlands there, somewhere around uh, the southeast and south central area. Massive population rises in some areas which have been struggling anyway and have got major issues in the healthcare infrastructure that they've got. And then when you think about um, the local authorities and young people, and this is specifically on 65 years and older, where people are living now age 65 or older, look at that coastal aspect. Coastal care in this country is not as good as urban and more inland care. Yet the majority of people we're going to need to treat and look after because they've got more complex issues, they've got four or more diseases, are going to be in the coast. So there's a massive effort at the moment from the Chief Medical Officer for the NHS to boost coastal healthcare services, because it's a major problem. We haven't got it where we need it at this moment in time for where everybody wants to. Understandably, when you retire, where do you want to go and live? You want to go and live by the coast, don't you? You know, I definitely do. So, just a little bit about the NHS in England, um, just to give a bit of context, ultimately. Universal healthcare coverage since its establishment in 1948. 307 NHS organisations make the NHS, ultimately. Um, the NHS is not a thing, it's an umbrella, it is a term, it's what we love. But all of these organisations make the NHS. 8,000 or more, and a lot more now, primary care, um, so doctors, dentists, community pharmacy, 42 new integrated care systems that got launched in July this year, over 2 million staff from a headcount point of view, over 350 different careers. When we think about the workforce in the NHS, most people automatically, and the Secretary of State does as well, goes to doctors, nurses, dentists at the moment, and doctors and dentists as part of our ABCD. There's 350 careers. We've only, people only generally talk about three. I'm an allied health profession, and Karen's at an AHP as well. We're the third largest workforce in the NHS, let alone all of the great people that keep the NHS running, from our porters to our cleaners to our administration staff and our management. If anybody ever says there's too much management in the NHS, about 1.2% of the entire budget spent on management compared to about 3 to 5% in every other industry in this country. So um, I would say that as a senior leader of the NHS, once I protect him. <coughs> but we, we are efficient from that point of view. And from an education point of view, we've got different models of education, different funding across the profession. So there's no parity. You do things differently through history. Uh, and, and I've been on a journey with colleagues trying to address a lot of that. 
Pre-registration nursing, midwifery, allied health courses take on average three years. So unfortunately, as, as universities know, we don't have people just stood at the side of the wings waiting to join the NHS. It takes three years to train our future professionals. And for dentists and doctors, it's a minimum of five years before they start specialising. To get a consultant is about nine to ten years overall. So we need to start thinking a much more longer term. Uh, and dare I say, in an academic free speech environment, outside of party and parliamentary terms. We've got to get away from that. And also outside of fiscal terms, i.e. everything runs to a one year budget. It's just not possible to have a future workforce with all of that. We've got 76 universities in England offering healthcare programmes and uh, 34 medical schools overall. So just to really, I'm going to run through some of these slides quickly so I can get onto the core bit of what I want to talk to you about. We've got these new integrated care systems. They are the executive of the NHS in your area. The one in this area is North Yorkshire and Humber integrated care system, um, newly set up from the previous uh, CCGs, clinical commissioning groups that used to exist with a new board and a new direction and a uh, legislative mandate. There are some very clear things that the integrated care system has to do and has to prove that it's doing. Otherwise, the executives won't have a job in the future. It's been written into law. If they don't achieve it, they'll be gone. So there's a massive push now to make sure the population is represented and what's happening in the NHS is delivering the population needs locally. So that's the system. Um, there's usually about one, one to two million people altogether. Then we've got places. So places around here will consist of York and surrounding areas, Hull, Harrogate, they're all the different places that make up the integrated care system in this area. And then we've got neighbourhoods where our primary care networks, so collections of GPs, uh, practices get together and look at efficiency amongst themselves. And there's some great work happening across primary care networks uh, around the country. So the reason I share this is going back to one of the things I first said about complexity and simplicity. This is, this is complex. This is trying to bring so many people together in a different way to achieve the same goal. And it all starts by conversation. It all starts by people knowing this is what we want to achieve for our population and agreeing it. And not then walking outside the door and, and trashing it. So this is, this is for me one of the most radical reforms the NHS is ever going to have and it's got to work. If this doesn't work, there's nothing else really. So I'm, I'm all behind these things because I think this is absolutely the right thing to do. Represented by local people. The challenge that I've put forward is where's universities in all of this? What are we doing about the education for our NHS and our health and care staff? Because Integrated care systems are not just about the NHS, they're about social care, working with local authorities, and that's absolutely vital for the population health. But universities aren't there. Now, it's a challenge because universities are money-making machines to some degree, but we're also there from a public perspective. These public universities, you know, every vice chancellor I speak to always says, oh, we want the public coming through, let's open the campus up and get as many people in as we can. Which is absolutely the right thing to do, but we've, you've got to be around the table to make that happen as well, haven't you? So I've been pushing that um, as, much as, as much as we can. So we've got these levels. We've got the place level, the system level, a group of systems. So the group of systems in this area for me would be Yorkshire as a whole. So you've got North Yorkshire and Humber, West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire. Makes a nice group of systems to do what it needs to do for Yorkshire. And then we've got the nationwide impact that we can have. So these are the levels that we can operate from an education perspective to sustain the workforce. There's things that need to be done at place. There's things that need to be done in the system. There's things that need to be done across systems. And there's things that we need to still do nationally. Some of the national things are like clinical psychology. There's a small number overall, but we've got to promote it and we've got to get efficiency from doing things at scale ultimately. So remember those levels. I want to introduce you to Paul as well. Paul is 79 years old, turns 80 at the end of this month. Uh, and he's used the NHS for loads of things. He's used it for coughs, viruses, injuries, dental issues, optical care, cancer treatment, 
kidney removed, triple heart bypass, diabetes, general malaise, and a, a sig significant head injury following a fall down the stairs, fractured his neck. Um, what a waste of money, eh? All of those things costing you money to treat. What do you think of that? How much do you reckon all that's cost? Hundreds of thousands, probably, ultimately. Is that the right thing to do? Yes. Of course it is. Of course it is. Absolutely the right thing to do. Cradle to grave. All the time. Doesn't matter what's going on. That is absolutely the right thing to do. And of course, in supporting Paul's care, was all of these different professionals. Not just one person. It's not just done by his GP. It's not just done by the consultant. It's all of the different professionals that are helping him to get better, to live a healthier life, to live the best life that he possibly can do. We've got all the doctors, the AHPs, the administration staff. And we can often get bogged down in that, well, I haven't had an appointment yet. Oh, I've got to go this day. I've got to go Sunday morning. I have to go for an eye um, examination with a consultant at nine o'clock on a Sunday morning. And when they rang me up and they said, we can do Sunday, I was gobsmacked. I was like, yeah, yeah, brilliant. I'm really up for that. We've got to start making care much more accessible. And we've got to make sure these professionals that are trying to their best have got every tool that they need and they know that there's more people coming, that they're trained to the best levels that they can be, not only in the job that they're doing, but the next person that's coming through that door is trained to their standard as well. There's a lot we need to do to get that parity and to support that. So, quick question, I told you there'll be some audience participation. How many nursing, midwifery and allied health professional students are there right now in England? Anybody got an idea? Go on, I'm going to walk out. Someone, I'm going to pick on somebody. I can see you a bit better now. Anybody? 100,000, higher or lower? Higher. Higher? Who said higher? How many do you reckon, Karen? 150,000 higher or lower? I heard somebody whisper higher. Probably because they don't want me to go how many then. Um, about 130,000 at this moment in time are studying to be a nurse, midwife or allied health profession student uh, in England alone. That takes a massive infrastructure to train that many people. That's our 76 universities, 34 medical schools for, for the medics. Uh, there's roughly about 25,000 doctors in training, it would be more than that, sorry. Um, probably about 35, 40,000 doctors in training at this moment in time as well, just to do their first five years uh, of training. So we're going up to you know, nearly 200,000 people at a time. And guess what? We need more. We need a lot more. We really, really do. The estimates at the moment are probably looking around minimum next year, 10% increase. Minimum. Over the next couple of years, it's, 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 it's really shooting up because of all of those complexities that I mentioned at, at the start. But we've got a few challenges with that. And, and I know all universities have been in this situation. We saw a massive dip in 2017 of applications. There was a major thing that happened in 2017 uh, which caused this dip. Anybody know what it was? Removal of the NHS bursary. It was indeed the removal of the NHS bursary. So we stopped paying universities um, for students and they had to start paying themselves. Naturally, we're going to get that dip, aren't we? People are going to go, I ain't interested. Let's stop that. The great thing is it started to rise again. It has started to rise. We're offering different funding packages now called the Learning Support Fund. So the number of applicants are going up. We had the best year ever last year. Uh, unfortunately, it's dipped by about 7% this year. Um, and I can only surmise, again, in an academic free environment for free speech, some of that's related to the media. I really do think that. You know, we had a massive spike in 2020 for a couple of reasons. <coughs> Firstly, COVID hit, every other job was 
Not really that secure. What job was secure? The NHS. First thing on the key worker list, NHS. What were we doing every Thursday night at eight o'clock? We were clapping. What a sense of pride. Who doesn't want to be part of a team where, do you know what? Every single person's out on their doorstep clapping for you. How amazing do you think that felt for people? Motivation to keep going and do the best. Now what are we doing? Inflation's gone up, loads of issues, it's pay gone up. No, real terms pay has stopped for quite a number of years. Uh, and now we're seeing, I think it's today, the ballots have started for strike action for our healthcare workforce across the country. That's really scary. I'm really scared about that. And I'm scared what that does to our future supply of healthcare staff, ultimately. We can see there's been a change in the percentage from the different age groups. We had a, a big uptake in mature students, uh, which was fantastic. People coming in with different life experiences, second careers. That has dipped again this year, unfortunately. But there is some good news in that the projections for the number of 18 year olds is on the rise. That's a great thing for universities outside of healthcare as well. But it, hopefully if we can harness that, and really make the NHS a very attractive place to work, not only for clinicians, but for all of the 350 different careers across finance, IT, digital support, all of those services, we can really start to make a difference uh, across, across the populations, ultimately. Well, I've got a little video. I don't know if this is going to work. Hopefully it will. My fault for not checking properly earlier. No, so this video, I'll just talk through. This video, some of you may have seen this before. This video is about a ball pass, passing the ball. And these different people pass the ball. And you, you as an audience are designed to count how many times the players in white pass the ball. And you'd probably count 13. But what you might not see is during that, a gorilla walks on and walks off. A player disappears and the background changes colour. And the reason why I like this video is when we think about the NHS and we think about what we're doing for patients, education is that gorilla. Education is that player going off. Education is that background changing. We don't notice it, we don't pay attention to it until somebody points it out. And there's an amazing thing happening at this moment in time um, which is going to help that point. Health Education England organisation I work for is being abolished ultimately. It's being transformed with the new NHS England. So we're creating a central NHS body which is merging the current NHS England, Health Education England and NHS Digital. And that's designed to make all of these three key components of the NHS, service delivery, education and digital, absolutely the centre of what the NHS is about. Because at the moment it's an add-on, it's a done-to. And we don't think often across the NHS, if I want to make a change to the service or I want to make a change to the patients, What's the education I need to make that happen? And when we introduce new services, we generally move people from one area to another. Great, we've got a new service running, but what happened to that previous area when we've not got the right supply coming through in the first place to backfill ultimately uh, as well? So there's some big questions that we need to start asking. We need to think what skills do we need? What numbers do we need to fulfill those skills? Do they have the right values and behaviours to do the job that we want them to do? And where do we need them? So thinking about demand, we need to go, what's the demographic now? What's it projected? We know people are getting older. We know people are moving to the coast to retire. How do we start to fulfil that supply? What's that disease prevalence and what's that projected to do? Four or more diseases for individuals when they start hitting 65 and over. What innovations do we need and what new services do we need? Because we just can't keep doing the same. We can't keep getting more people to do the same stuff. We've got to innovate. We've got to have new services. 
And we need to think, what do people expect of us? You know, now, I could get my phone out, I could order a taxi and it'd be here in two minutes, I could order a pizza and it'd be here in 30 minutes. I can make an appointment and get a, somebody to come and look at my boiler within 30 minutes online. How long does it take to get an appointment with your GP? Who in here has to ring up at like eight o'clock in the morning and keep ringing, keep ringing and keep ringing? You know, and think hopefully someone's going to answer the phone at some point. And when they do answer, despite you being what you think is the first person on the phone, there's no more appointments. We've got to start thinking about the expectations. And my expectation is, if I ring anybody, I'm going to get the help and the definitive care that I need. I don't care if I ring my GP, 999, 111, uh, or the Queen. I want to get the answer, ultimately. That's where we need health services and the expectation. Do we have the capabilities to do that? And do we have the capacity to do that? That's what we need to build. We then need to think about efficiency. Is this the best way to achieve the outcomes that we want to see for the population? I will share with you now one of my biggest bugbears across the NHS. We don't stop doing things. We don't say no to things. We just keep doing more and more and more and more and more. And sometimes we don't go, is that the right thing to now be doing? It might have been the right thing 10 years ago, but is it now the right thing to do? How do we stop things? How do we switch it off? Or how do we make it integrated into something new so we are getting efficiency? We're not just carrying on doing the same thing. You know, COVID hit, tragedy. Do you think, you know, I, I spent a bit of time in primary care trying to get people to do online consultations to patients. You would not believe the hassle I had trying to get anybody to do that. There was no hope, absolutely no hope anybody was going to do that. Overnight, COVID hits through, I'm not going in, I'm going to do it online. You know, hurrah. We got there eventually, but through some serious tragedy. So we need to think about the outcomes. And what gets in the way of doing the right thing? What can stop us from doing the right thing ultimately? We need to start breaking down those barriers. Ask, can it be done differently? Is it providing value for money? We've got to start thinking like a taxpayer with some of this. And ultimately ask the question, is it worth it? That sounds really harsh, but actually, is it worth doing this? Are we going to just make one person's life better or are we making many people's lives better? We've got to start asking some serious questions. And we've got to start asking questions about inequality. Is what we're doing accessible to everybody? We might seem like it's accessible to some, but is it truly accessible to everybody? And is that population using our services? We can have services sat there that people don't use. So how do we make it accessible? Or how do we make sure people use it? And what's stopping them? We need to find these things out, because otherwise we're wasting money and we're wasting efficiency. Do we know what the population needs or do we truly know what they are? And do we include the population in our decision making to know that we're inclusive? <coughs> now the old adage is, those that shout the loudest get the most. We want to tackle those people that aren't shouting the loudest, so we know what their needs are, so we can deliver for them uh, as best as we can. And are we co-designing and co-producing these services? So, how do we balance it? We've got less money, so we need to prioritise. We need to switch things and we need to stop things and look at what isn't really working. And we need to be much more outcome focused on education, not input focused. We need more services. So that means preventative care, we need quicker diagnostics, we need access to care, we need people trained to understand the needs of that now, not to be trained for the needs of it five years ago. That's why we need people that are training the future healthcare workforce who are active in healthcare society at the same time. And of course we need more people, so we need quicker education. Big challenge I've put out quite a lot is, does it really need to take three years to do a degree? Ooh, I get different things all the time on that. I had one vice chancellor say to me, I could do it in two years, so I said, do it then. Do it. If that's, if you reckon you can do it, let's do it. We'll support you, we'll put the backing around it. So there's things that we can start to think differently about. Um, some of you may have heard this, 
particularly the Vice Chancellor said I can do it in two years, always talked about the harvest and why universities start in September because it was historically when the harvest had been done, that's when people are now getting a bit bored, we've got all the work out of the way, they need to do something else. Um, obviously I've, I've never done harvest in my life, I don't know if anybody else has, but you know, there are things that we've got antiquated across education that needs to change so that we can have more people and more flexible training. You know, we've, we've offered and in, in introduced over the last three years, I've been really proud to be part of our blended learning initiatives, accessing people that can't physically go to university every day to become a nurse and to become a midwife and to become an allied health professional. It's been transformational altogether, using technology in different ways to offer flexible training. But we need to think about these other factors. Housing has a major impact. The environment that we live in, it's a lovely city of York, it's great. But you're kind of a bit remote, aren't you, from around it. There's a massive big void, 45 minutes all the way around it to some degree. Finances has a major impact. We've got a very challenging fiscal economy at the moment. And of course, family and schools, all of these things impact on getting flexible training. And of course, we've not got enough workforce, so we need new routes into education. We need to support schools to gain the skills before university. We need better attraction of the roles or the place. We need better placements, massive project I've been working on. And we need to improve retention. Retention across nursing specifically ranges from 7%, sorry, um, attrition, attrition, across nursing ranges from 7% to 40%. That is shocking. From a taxpayer's point of view, we're putting that money in and we're not getting them in the NHS at the end of it. That's atrocious, so we're working on that. And of course, embedding better education and training. But, so we need to balance these scales ultimately. These are scales. If we have too much supply, we have no funding. If we have too little supply, we have no service. If we have too much demand, we get poor outcomes and expectations. And if we have too little demand, well, it's just never going to happen, is it really? <laughs> so we've got to keep balancing these scales throughout what we do. And we've got these different levers that can operate at those different levels that I spoke about earlier. Funding from an incentive or a penalty point of view is a lever. It's the biggest lever we have, £5.3 billion pounds a year. If nobody jumps at that, what's going wrong? We've got the demographics, that's a big lever for what we need to do. Over 65, four or more diseases in their life. We've got service improvements which can leverage education in a different way. We've got policy. It's a massive lever if the government says something and it comes down in policy, that really impacts on what we do. Of course we've got demand, innovation, scale is a lever. If we can scale things in a different way, we get better leverage, we get better efficiency, flexibility, and of course, making sure we've got an infrastructure. If we're investing as a country in the infrastructure to deliver education in the right way, we're going to get more leverage from it. But it's like turning a tanker, this is. How long do you reckon it takes to turn a tanker? About five miles in the sea, roughly, or to stop it at least. Education for healthcare is like moving a tanker. We can do a little bit, but we can't make massive turns. The environment we're in, we need a speedboat. We need to be able to adapt, move as quickly uh, as possible. So thinking about that from a simplexity point of view, we can break it down to input, process and output. From an input point of view, what's the funding available? What's the modelling saying to us? What's the strategy, what's the policy, and what's the planning that needs to go with all of that? From a process point of view, we need to think about the delivery of education. How do we revise, refine, and adapt as necessary in that speedboat fashion, not a tanker? And how do we encourage more of it? How do we incentivize it in the right way? And then thinking about our out output, is what are the outcomes we're getting for patients. If we're not getting the right outcomes, we're not putting the right inputs or processes in. We need to change it. What's our return on investment? Or when people talk about ROI to me, I prefer our return on intent. Did we get what we intended to do from this activity? Is it outputting on life expectancy? Are people living longer, healthier lives 
rather than just living longer. It's no good to live long if you're not enjoying it really, is it? And the quality of life is, is really, really important with that. So remember, it's not just clinical staff in the NHS. Education and training is for everybody across the NHS. So I know I've spoken a lot about clinical staff tonight, but I really want to emphasise everybody in the NHS, from the porters and the cleaners, all the way through to the chief executives, education and training is for everybody. And service delivery and education goes hand in hand. It cannot be separate. They've got to be interlinked. And that is absolutely part of the major plans moving forward. So, going back to Paul, what matters most to him is that he's treated quickly. He doesn't have to pay because he's tight. He, he knows what's going to happen. He, he knows that that person that's in front of him knows what they're going to do. They can explain it to him. They can help him feel better. They can get him home. He doesn't want to be in hospital or anywhere else. He wants to get home. He, know, he wants to know that he's going to be okay. And he wants to, them to tell him what he needs to do to help him in the future. And that's literally out of Paul's mouth. And the reason I know that is Paul's my granddad. So that's why I can call him tight. Um, but that is what, does anybody disagree with that? If you're sat there now thinking about what you want from the NHS, do you disagree with that? Is there anything you'd add on to it? Probably quick, or oh, quick, we've got quick on there. Yeah? Be treated as an individual. Be treated as an individual, absolutely. Treat me, not what's wrong with me. Absolutely agree with that. And also, who's the best person that probably know from a long-term condition point of view, the best person who knows about that condition is the patient, not the healthcare clinician. Listen to the patients, absolutely agree. So, to do this, we want a healthier, happier, secure and efficient NHS with the right numbers, uh, right, right workforce numbers, the right skills, the right values, the right behaviours at the right time and place now and for the future. That sounds fantastic, doesn't it? What an amazing vision and mission we can go for. But ultimately, this is all about saving lives. Having better lives, both in the system, in the place and in the neighbourhoods that we all live. And finally, the NHS is just people. Everything I said before about 307 organisations, 8,000 primary care, it doesn't matter, it doesn't work without people. And what the NHS is doing now, rightly so, is we're focusing on the people in the NHS, our current people and our future people. I hope that's been uh, of some interest and gives some insights and asks some serious questions, but um, Thank you very much to the Vice-Chancellor and, and the team at, at uh, York St. John University for inviting me and having me as a visiting professor. I'm very, very proud uh, to be associated with the university. And thank you all for coming and, and listening tonight. I think we've got a Q&A now as well. Thank you. Should we go over to the seats for this? That'd be a bit nicer. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Fantastic lecture. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things when we talk about education, um, having been, my wife is a doctor, um, one of the things that we've seen over a period of years, uh, from my point in Manchester and in North Staffordshire, has been the closing of nurse training schools, uh, where they train nurses, midwives, auxiliaries as they were. Perhaps they can be repurposed, but what well, at least you have the opportunity. It's like an apprentice training school, which I went to when I was with a company in Metal when I left school. You can train people exactly as you want them. Um, and, and you have the work experience immediately on the doorstep. What's the thinking behind, is, are we ever going to go back to having uh, training schools on, in hospitals again? Thank you. What's your name, by the way? Oh, sorry? What's your name? Uh, David. David. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's. I think it's a really good question. Uh, and it's a really good question for, for a couple of factors. Training needs to take place where people are going to work. Absolutely. 
You don't get that in any other sector, do you? If I want to be a mechanic, I don't, I don't go anywhere else. I actually work in the mechanics and learn about it. But what, what happened from the old days, we'll call it, of, of the days of in-hospital training schools, was we professionalised those jobs. And that's why they went to degrees. So we didn't used to have degrees when it was a, a training school in a hospital as such. So we professionalised it, both from a safety point of view for patients, but also to make sure we're getting the best people that we possibly can do. Now, there's an argument both ways, isn't there? Do we, the, was it the, um, the current Shadow Secretary of State for Health said the other week, do we need degrees for nurses? My answer is absolutely we do. We need degrees for all of our healthcare professions because we know that they're going to be educated to the right level to do what they, what they need to do to support people. However, saying that, uh, and David, your point's really important because the job of being a healthcare practitioner is hands-on. It's not writing papers and you know publishing and, and research in the academic sense, but it's really important that what we do write down is right and that we know what we're writing down. And the only way to do that is through doing professional qualifications. However, there are a lot of places now that are starting up major partnerships between universities and hospitals. And we've got, particularly in the area I live in Birmingham, there is a university hospital which has a school of nursing within it. It's closely linked to the university, so it can attract people in a different way. And of course, we've got the apprenticeship routes. So the apprenticeships in, in healthcare, we've got a number of them now. We've got training nurse associates, we've got associate um, practitioners before that. So we've got different levels of people to answer. <coughs> and work in the NHS, they're employed by the NHS and then released to do their education and training in the way that an old school of nursing kind of did uh, in that sense, but very much in partnership with universities so that we're maximising the opportunity to understand the educational aspect that you need to understand and having the hands-on experience. So usually apprenticeships work on a day release, one day a week you'll be doing your education side of it. The rest of it, you're working in the NHS, adapting and learning and bringing all of that experience from that one day into the practice that you give. It still takes time, still, they're not quick, these things aren't, but they're absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, and we need to grow them. We really do. Karen and I were discussing beforehand about the, the funding model of apprenticeships. We need, we need a different policy on apprenticeships for the NHS to make it really sustainable. Um, but it's, it's going back to that type of, type of approach. Thanks, David. Thank I probably do need a mic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a really interesting lecture. There's a huge amount of research and evidence being done now about what future generations look for in work and different expectations among different generations about how they're going to work in terms of flexibility and autonomy and sense of agency. Is the NHS working on changing the work offer? I guess the tasks remain the same, but the structure of work seems to me to stay as it always was, and perhaps that's not what's going to attract the generations in the future. I, I think you're absolutely right, Julia. Um, I think the, the challenge we've got is delivering patient care whilst delivering the expectations of the workforce. And it's difficult, you know, years ago, people would enter a career and they stayed here forever, you know, you'd be still here with these people, I've been a nurse for 40 years, I've worked on the same ward, um, it's becoming less and less so. And I think, you know, society's changed in that sense, because we've, we've got the challenging fiscal economy that we've got, pay rises haven't happened across the NHS in the way that they have in, in private industry, in some sectors, not all, and I think we've got to tap into that. We've got to tap into the career that you can have in the NHS. It doesn't mean you have to stay in the same role, but it's how do, you, how do we, as the NHS, develop the individual? Because we don't want people to go. We really don't. We can't afford for them to go, ultimately. We can't invest all of this money in getting them trained and supporting them, and then five, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, we lose them because we're not continuing to invest in them in the way that we need to, both as an individual, but also as a professional. And I'm probably, you know, testimony to some of that, in the sense I jumped out of the NHS, I went to work for a university for 
three years and what have you. I've ended up going back. But you know, but I've I've been a, in the paramedic trade for five odd years, six years. But that's still the fundamental aspect of who I am and what I want to do. And there is an aspect of of what can we tap into to make people want to stay? How do we develop them as individuals? And how do we think much more broadly? So one thing I'm interested in with integrated care systems is what's in a name? So you know, what, what, why does it matter that I work for such and such and such NHS trust? Well, actually, I'm not bothered about that. What I'm bothered about is working in the NHS. And how do I find the right role for me in the NHS? Doesn't matter if it's not in the same environment or what have you. So how do we keep people in the NHS and have proper talent management pipelines at the level they want to get to? Not everybody wants to become a manager. Not everybody wants to become chief exec and things like that. And at the moment, we're only set up for those type of things. We're not set up to say, how do you become the best nurse you can be or the best speech and language therapist you can be because you don't want to progress anywhere. How do we keep investing in you still? I think it's a major, major challenge. And we need some funding to go with it. Um, we've had CPD funding uh, in the last three years. So every nurse, midwife, healthcare profession got about £300 a year allocated to them, which was essentially held by, by organisations. That's led to some great things, but it's not led to something for everybody. So we need to think about the funding aspect. We need to think about asking people the right question. And it, some organisations have cracked this, some haven't. You've got to be treated like a person, you can't be treated like a number. And until some organisations realise that, they're always going to have a workforce problem, ultimately. Okay. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, we have a final question there. Uh, uh, thanks for the lecture uh, today. It, it links to what Julie was saying. You um, remarked on the disparity between clapping during the pandemic and the lack of pay rise. There's two key words that I thought were missing in the slides, and you just referred, as Julie did, to them. One is people are leaving the NHS because of its culture, and, and what is going to be done to really, really modernise the culture, because the culture is not of now. And secondly, uh, the other factor from the pandemic is the, is the inability and lack of response to emotional labour and the huge disparity between the ask and then the give yeah. back to staff. So I, I'd like to see more on your slides in the future about culture and about emotional labour. I think yeah, you're absolutely right and, and in other lectures that I've done this, this the two words that I use around culture and, and emotional labour is courage and passion. I think what we need to embody and empower across the people that make the NHS what it is, is how do we give them the courage to do what they think is the right thing to do. We don't have to go beat them with a stick if something goes wrong. Give them the courage, give them that empowerment to release their potential. Because when all, all the evidence ever says, if you've got happy staff, we've got happy patients. And so if we can give them the courage and make sure they've got the courage to do what's right, that will also go hand in hand for me with the passion. Because you know, when, when people join the NHS, when people become a profession, even if you're not going into a clinical setting, you join it because you, you want to feel part of something bigger. We're doing the right thing for the country. We're doing some amazing things. I want to be part of that. So we've got to harness that passion. And we've got to make sure the passion that people get when they join never diminishes because the organisation, the NHS and the population is demonstrating that passion back to them in multiple ways. There's one really, really easy way that we can solve some of the cultural issues across the NHS at the moment. Some organisations have done it, yes, there are other, other major issues. Free car parking. Why on earth as a member of staff do I have to pay to park my car at the hospital that I'm working at? It, it's, it's bizarre. And I know other sectors you have to do it and you might not have car parking and all of those things. But when particularly hospitals are not really based near great accessible routes for people that are doing six o'clock starts in the morning or finishing at midnight or two in the morning and things like that. Culturally, if we, if we give people what they're asking for, the majority of people would ask for free car parking 
I think we're onto onto the right level of cultural change. Thank you for your question. I absolutely agree. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. I'm going to have to hold my list of challenging <laughs> questions, <laughs> but there might be time out there. Um, so I would like to formally thank Professor Leyland on behalf of our students, our staff and our guests for a most interesting and thought-provoking lecture. Your passion for the NHS and particularly for its workforce has really come through strongly this evening and you've challenged us all um, about the role that we have in being really positive um, about the NHS uh, in all that we do in our professional life but also um, in our sort of life at home. Um, so we have a small gift to express our appreciation, which my assistant should <laughs> provide. with your future work and in fact there is very exciting news um, I hope you don't mind me revealing this um, I didn't know until this evening um, Adam is moving to Yorkshire Ambulance Service and is moving house to be in Yorkshire I've already booked him for teaching it's just so exciting <laughs> so we hope to see a lot more of you um, but we wish you all the best for your future work and look forward to our continued engagement with you as a valued member of the York St John community. So thank you all for coming and please do join us just outside for refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.